A few miles south of Mektila there was, and probably still is, a wood containing a little temple. The trees were very tall and close together on its outskirts, forming a thick protective screen, but within the wood they were more widely spaced, with dim clearings under the high spreading branches. How wide the wood was I never discovered, but it can't have been more than fifty or sixty yards in depth, and beyond there was open ground stretching to another belt of trees. It must have been quite a pretty place, with those shaded clearings and the tall trunks reaching up to the high foliage through which the light filtered. I sometimes wonder what it looks like now. That wood and a nearby village were among the places used by the Japanese as concentration points for their counter-attack on Mektila, and I believe our intelligence pinpointed it as a result of a chance discovery made following the night action I've just described. Among the Japanese killed by our dawn patrols outside the wire was an officer. I heard he had taken cover in a culvert, and on his body were found plans listing the Jap concentration points. One of them was the Temple Wood, and our Div Command marked it for urgent attention. Nine Section, of course, was not aware of this. Following the night action, the whole battalion withdrew to make Tila, after an excursion which had lasted several days, accounted for more than a hundred Japanese, and more importantly had helped to embarrass his build-up. Similar actions had been fought all round Mektila at this time. The official history likens Cowan to a boxer using straight lefts to prevent his opponent getting close in, and it's a good simile. Jap was never given time to settle for a major assault. Nine sections' impression, and it is still mine, is that Jap had taken far worse than he gave, and I am surprised by the official history's statement that our battalion took 141 casualties in two days during our foray from Mektila. The regimental histories don't confirm the figure, and I wonder if the official version isn't referring to a longer period. But not for me to argue. I can only say that if the battalion did take that kind of punishment, we weren't aware of it. We came back to Mektila and spent the next week or so in our pits, watching the wire brewing up and waiting, and in that time other units of 17th Div threw two of Cowan's straight lefts at the Little Temple Wood and its adjacent village. According to the official history, the first attack ended in failure, with three tanks brewed up, and Jap following our withdrawal uncomfortably closely. The second attempt was also repulsed, and two more tanks were lost. Then it was our turn. We rode out on the Shermans of Probin's horse on a fine sunny morning, knowing that something was in the wind, for three men had been added to the section. One was a lance corporal. For some reason we had been short of a section second in command until now. Another a rotund South Cumbrian, a sort of miniature grandass called Watty, and the third was reputed to be a recaptured deserter, and looked it. So Corporal Little had been told anyway. He and I were riding on the front of the tank, either side of the gun with our backs to the turret, flanked by Forster and the Duke, and with Grandas, who needed room, reclining on the sloping front at our feet and delivering judgment. Ah, don't see the point of desertion missile. Not too tear anyways. I mean, in Blighty a fella can stay on the rune living in the railway nafis and tok h canteens, but we're the El Yigantago in India. Aliz. Any roads what I'm saying is that if you desert Utir, I mean in India, you'd have to be doolally to bugger off in Burma. The Ridcaps is bound to cotch thee, and court martial gives thee the choice of five years in Trimulgari, or paint jungle, or come in Oopt Road to get the bollocks shot off. It's a Moog's game. You don't have to be a deserter to be sent up the road and have your bollocks shot off, said the Duke. Or hadn't you noticed? Mind you, continued Grandas, there's this to be said for being a deserter. They say that if you ask to go oop the road and you gets kilt or wounded, the army reckons you've made amends like, and scroobs your record. Ah, don't think that's bloody fair, they give me seven days in close tack for gain absent in blighty once, and if I get kilt, it'll still be on me crime sheet. That's cause you didn't try hard enough, said Little. You've got to commit a big crime to get a big remission. Why did you go absent, Grandas? I asked. Ah, oh, there was this tart in Silleth and R was young and daft. He sighed. She wasn't worth it. R was grossly deceived. Aye, things as come to sicken a pass. Thu can't tell mistress face servant lass. She wore trousers and a bloody foony a fancied her in trousers. You're a bloody perv you are, said Forster. Oh, aye, listen to Dr. Freud. Who's Dr. Freud? A bloody professor. I don't suppose that's what they called him in Vienna, said the Duke, but it's a not inaccurate description. Anyways, said Grandas with finality, if I was ever daft enough to desert and got done for it, I'd sooner take the chance of a bullet in me bum than spend five year filling an empty and wells ink glass ooze. So there.
Someone said unkindly that anybody shooting Grandass could hardly fail to hit him in the bum, and Grandass retorted that at least he wouldn't get his brains blew out if they did, not like Soom Cliver boogers. They were having to shout to make themselves heard above the rattle of the tracks as the Shermans rumbled over the sunlit paddy and the swirling dust was becoming a nuisance. So I withdrew from the conversation to read for the third or fourth time the letter that had arrived from home last night. My parents knew I was in Burma, and that, with the possible exception of aircrew, it was generally believed to be the worst ticket you could draw in the lottery of active service. Those months must have been the longest of their lives. Whatever anxieties the soldier may experience in the field can be nothing to the torment of those at home. I don't know how parents and wives stand it. Perhaps family experience is a help. Every generation of my people, as far back as we knew, had sent somebody to war, and my grandmother's comment on Chamberlain's speech on September 3rd, 1939, had been simply, Well, the men will be going away again. Her uncle had served in the Crimea, her brother had died in the Second Afghan, two of my aunts had lost sweethearts in the Great War, my father had been wounded in East Africa, and two uncles had been in the trenches. Probably it was a not untypical record for a British family over a century, but whether it made my absence easier or harder to bear, who knows. One thing was certain, they were not going to distress me by letting a hint of worry show in their letters, which were full of news and trivia and comedy. I hope mine were too. I was guiltily aware of being a poor correspondent who wrote briefly, and usually when I wanted something. My last had contained a request for cigarettes. My father wrote that they were on their way, and described how my aunts, those genteel maiden ladies, had exclaimed in dismay on learning that I had started smoking, at which my grandmother, a lively nonagenarian, had demanded to know if they would deny the solace of tobacco to a man who was standing at Armageddon. She had added mischievously that there were worse temptations than cigarettes for a young soldier in the Orient, and she didn't mean drink either. This had opened up such visions of their nephew's possible depravity, that they couldn't sleep, and in the waking small hours my elder aunt had been sure she'd heard the rattles, which meant that the German bombers were dropping poison gas. She had ventured out, in dressing gown, slippers and gas mask, with her handkerchief steeped in O. De Cologne and the ARP wardens had found her shining her torch, on the local pillar box to see if it had changed colour, and so on. My grandmother had taken to referring to two of the Nazi leaders as ribbon strip and gorbels. My father had been to see a night at the opera, and wished that he could swing on trapezes like the Marx brothers. There had been unpleasant scenes, with allegations of fixing and corruption, at the church jumble sale, because the minister's daughter had won the prize doll by correctly guessing its name, Wellwoodina. My father and mother, respectively liberal and conservative, were thinking of voting Labour at the forthcoming election because the candidate was one of my father's patients and an old friend. It was a picture of that happy, funny, eccentric family of mine and their little world. So far, and yet so near. Corporal Little asked me what I was grinning about and Forster opined that it was a Louvre letter fray soon bint, and you're wasting your time, Jock. She'll be getting done by soon yank pilot. And Grandass said, leave the lad alone, he'll larn for hissle. Oh yes, you got the cream of intellectual discourse in nine section. The tanks rumbled to a halt not far from a low bund, and about fifty yards beyond it lay the temple wood, dense and silent in the sunlight. We debused, and Long John and Gale and Sergeant Hutton passed among us, checking that all was as it should be. There were three companies of the battalion spread across the paddy facing the wood, with the Shermans at intervals, but we were aware only of the sections immediately on either side, and there we waited, the section in a rough line settling our equipment, taking a last swig from the chagles, charging our magazines, and finally, at a word from Little, fixing bayonets. So it was going to be a puka attack. Until that moment I, for one, had not been sure what the object of the operation was. The strength of our force, the presence of the tanks, had suggested something big, and now it was confirmed. The screen of trees beyond the little bund looked peaceful enough, but Jap would be there, well dug in. He would be watching us at this moment. There are few sounds as menacing as a bayonet being fixed. Mine was the old sword type, with the locking ring clicking into place with the smoothness of good Edwardian machinery. Grandass on my immediate right was nipping his fingers with one of the new pig stickers, and cursing, his face crimson in the heat. On my left, Parker was drawing his cookery and resheathing it, and automatically I reached back to make sure mine was loose in its sheath and that my knife hilt was handy in my small pack. 
Suddenly it seemed very hot indeed, with hardly a breath of wind. Just behind us, the Sherman's engine coughed and roared. A bearded and turbaned head peered out of the turret and shouted in Hindustani to someone inside, and the roaring died to a murmur. Little came towards me, two grenades in his hands. Gives your Bren magazines, Jock, and take these, their stands. Stanley was number two to steal, the Bren gunner, and Little was seeing to it that he had plenty of spares. Are we going in, Corp? Aye, in a bit, when the Yanks have doon their stoof. He nodded past me, and as I tested the grenade pins and put them in my pouch, I turned to look. I had been aware of a far-off murmur growing louder. From behind us, three distant dots in the sky were coming closer. Tomahawk fighters in camouflage paint, which covered the famous shark's jaws, with which the flying tigers decorated their engine cowlings. They came roaring in at treetop level over us, and zoomed up in a climb as they passed above the wood, banking as they soared up into the blue. Advance to the bund, shouted Hutton. Take cover and keep your eyes, Doon. We moved forward and lay against the low bank, and from overhead came the thundering whine as the first tomahawk hurtled down in a steep dive. While it was still behind us, two small dark objects detached from it, falling at a steep angle to land on the edge of the wood with a crashing double explosion and sheets of orange flame. Smoke and dust billowed up, obscuring the trees, and then the second tomahawk came, repeating the performance with the third on its heels. The ground shook as they pounded the wood, which was now entirely hidden by a great cloud. In came the tomahawks again, unloading their bombs, and this time three of them failed to explode. The aircraft banked away in a great arc, and soon the whine of their engines died away. That was the airstrike over, and now it was the Sherman's turn. As the engines roared, Grandus, lying on the bank two yards away, looked along at me. Looky boogers, them Yank pilots, they'll be sitting in the Casanova in Cal the Neat, supping cocktails. War a life, eh? Parker must have heard him, for he laughed on my other side and turned on his back, looking up at the sky and hummed. All reet pipe doon, said Hutton, but he was grinning, it must have been a new one to him. But now the Sherman was clanking forward through a gap in the bund. The great mass of dust-coloured steel rolled on a few yards and stopped. Its hatch was closed, but the big gun was traversing from side to side and lowering to the point-blank position. Suddenly it crashed, the tank shook, and the shell burst with an almighty roar in the depths of the wood. Up and down the line the other tanks began blazing away, and then the machine guns started chattering, and the whole screen of trees was shaking as though in a gale. Through the slowly dispersing haze left by the tomahawk's bombs, we could see the foliage being ripped to shreds. All along the bank, men were craning as they watched. I stole a glance behind and saw Hutton was on his feet. Farther along, Long John was checking his watch. Gale, rifle in hand, his bush hat at a rakish angle, was talking to his runner. Abruptly the firing stopped. On your feet, roared Hutton, and as we stood up, wait for it. This was it then, the moment you read about in books and see in films, and by God it was happening to me. Ahead, the wood still seemed to be sending back the echo of the cannonade, but now the foliage was steady again, and the dust had settled. There was a long moment stillness broken only by the growl of the Sherman, holding its ground twenty yards ahead, not more than thirty from the edge of the wood. A branch, hanging by a thread after the bullet hail, suddenly fell, sending up a little swirl of dust. I glanced right. Grandas had one foot on the bank, leaning forward. Beyond him were two of the new men, the Lance Jack and the reputed deserter. Parker, on my left, had his rifle at the port, and beyond him Steele was adjusting his brensling, the big LMG resting on his hip. Stanley was removing his hat and replacing it firmly. I found I was hissing through my teeth and recognised it as Bonnie Dundee. But I hadn't time to digest this peculiar reaction when Little was walking forward between Parker and Steele, crossing the bank, and Hutton was shouting again, Advance, keep your distance, new advance. Up the bank and over, the shuffle of boots in the morning quiet, the slight creak and rustle of equipment, the dark green figures on either side moving in a slow, steady advance, the stationary tank, its tracks clogged with earth and coarse grass ten yards to my right front, the slight figure of Little, rifle at the trail, his head obscured by the tilted bush hat, to my left and out in front, and there was a faint crack like a cap pistol from the wood, and Little gave a sharp cough, spun half round and went down like an empty sack. Hitting the deck, face down on the scrubby earth, automatically whipping rifle to shoulder in the lying position, puffs of dust leaping from the ground to my left, Parker rolling over, yelling, the left breast of his bush shirt blood-stained, a scream from the right, a blinding cloud of dust and gravel striking me in the face, 
the rattle of machine gun fire from the wood and the irregular cracks of rifle fire. Someone was bawling, covering fire, and I was shooting obediently into the wood at ground level, aware that on my right Grandass was doing the same, and that Parker was crawling rapidly back to the bank. One glance I took, and he was dripping blood as he scrambled to the bank and over, caught in the bloody open, flat-footed Jesus. Beyond Grandass the Lance Jack was trying to pull himself clear with his leg trailing, and the deserter was absolutely sitting up. I still don't know why. I pumped off another couple of shots, realized the futility of it, looked left, and Steele had the Bren at his shoulder, left hand on the stock, right hand reaching forward for the magazine. There was a sharp clang. A silver streak appeared on the side of the magazine and Steele reared back, his face contorted, scrambling up onto his knees. Blood was streaming down his arm. The bullet had gone through hand and shoulder. He yelled something and, this I shall never forget, actually shook his uninjured fist at the wood before turning to run for the shelter of the Bund. And there was the Bren gun, the section's most precious possession, lying unattended. I've asked myself a thousand times, did I hesitate? God only knows, and perhaps some day he'll tell me, for I genuinely am not sure. Probably I wanted to, and this is what has made me wonder. That, and the knowledge that with four men hit all around me in as many seconds, and the shots kicking up the dirt in what seemed to be your proverbial hail of lead, that Bren was about as untempting an article as I've ever seen. And then I was starting to crawl towards it, and Hutton, flat on the ground behind me, was yelling and signalling to Stanley, the Bren's number two, and Stanley, who had been face down just beyond it all the time, was grabbing its handle and hauling it away. Jock, it was Hutton, coover him. For what it was worth, I started to fire into the wood, and Stanley and Bren rolled over the bank and out of sight. Behind me, Hutton spoke, more quietly now. Oh, Reet, hod the fire. Hide Doon. I put my head flat on the butt, reaching behind me for another clip from my bandolier, moving cautiously in the belief that any obvious movement was liable to attract those goddamned Jap snipers. To my right, Grandass was lying as close to Mother Earth as his great belly would let him. He looked towards me and blew out his cheeks. There was no one on my left, just two patches of blood where Steel and Parker had been hit. Christ, I thought, are Grandass and I the only ones left? Intermittent cracks were sounding in the wood, but they didn't seem to be coming this way. The Sherman's LMG was rattling away, and in behind it an Indian soldier, don't ask me where he had come from, was leaning against the metal, clutching his thigh, his trouser leg was sodden with blood. Grandass, Hutton again. When I say jow, get out of it, jock, five runes rapid fire. I blasted away and through the din heard Hutton's jow, and the sound of a great body taking flight. Reet, jock, jow. Grandass was still short of the bank when I went over it like a bird. The first thing I saw was steel a yard away. He was white as paint, his eyes shut, but his jaw was working up and down. An orderly had torn away his shirt, and his shoulder and chest were a mass of blood. The orderly was padding the shoulder wound, while another wrapped a gauze dressing round his hand. Beyond him Parker was propped up against the bank, stripped to the waist, holding a field dressing to his shoulder. Gale was bending over him, then turning away to shout. A jeep came bouncing up to the bank and Gale helped Parker to climb in. The orderlies were lifting steel onto a stretcher, preparing to load him in also. I didn't see them, but the Lance Corporal and the alleged deserter had both been hit. Farther along the bank rifles and Brens were firing, the Sherman guns were crashing again. I realized that I was sitting idle, breathing hard, and that one knee was painful, where I had grazed it in hitting the deck. I would guess that perhaps three minutes had passed since we started to advance. I jerked open my bolt, ejecting a spent case, and saw that my magazine was empty. While I was charging it, a tall lance corporal whose face in my memory is that of the late Lyndon Johnson came running in a crouch to confer with Hutton. They peered over the bank, and Hutton signalled to me. When Kang goes over the top, you give him cover and fire as hard as you can. Stanley, you give automatic fire. Reet, Jack. On you go, son. Kang took a run at the bank and went over, dodging from side to side as he ran towards the still green figure of Corporal Little face down on the earth. Kang dived down beside him, and even as I was firing I could see that he was speaking. I reloaded and began firing again as he came zigzagging back towards us. Halfway he stumbled, Hutton swore, and then Kang came tumbling over the bank in a shower of dust, gasping and clutching his forearm. Blood was running between his fingers. He shook his head. Bus! was all he said, and Hutton groaned deep in his throat. Two more jeeps were pulling up, scattering the earth, and the wounded were being helped into them. 
The one carrying Parker and Steele was reversing with a rasp of tires, and Parker, his dressing in place, actually grinned and waved with his sound arm. All along the bank men were lying, waiting. I think I remember Long John on one knee, talking to Gale and pointing off to the left. The firing along our front had died away to an occasional shot, or Bren burst. The tank firing had stopped, and the wood itself was silent. They had stopped us almost before we had started, and now they would be reloading in their pits and bunkers, waiting for us to try again. I remembered the wounded Indian and took a cautious look over the bank. He was standing up now, talking to the bearded Indian, who was presumably the tank commander, and was looking out of his hatch, something which in his position I'd not have done for a pension. I had the impression from their gestures that the wounded man wanted to get into the tank and was being denied. Grandass rolled up beside me. Tick as edit, fuck me. His face was purple, running sweat. That shows you what airstrikes and tanks is worth. Fucking hell. Will we go in again? We'll fucking have too, not by the front fucking door, though. Hey, wet the L's gun on. That booger's edit and ah. Uh. He was peering over the bank at the Sherman. The hatch was down again, and the wounded sepoy was dragging himself in behind the tank feebly, a foot at a time. He rolled over on his back. His whole trouser leg was black with blood to the thigh, and then he was dead. You could tell from the way the body seemed to subside, as though something had been let out of it. Awoy, said Grandass, and scrambled to his feet. Hutton was waving to us, and we doubled towards him, crouching to keep under cover of the bank. The rest of the section, what was left of it, was there. Stanley with the Bren, Nixon, Wedge, the Duke, and other men whom I didn't know. This presumably was nine section reconstituted. In less than a minute, we'd lost over a third of our original number. Then Gale was leading the way to the left, along the bank which must have curved in towards the wood, for presently we were on the edge of the trees, taking up firing positions. I have to say that I am not sure how we got there. It is another of those hiatuses in memory when nothing much happened to compare with the minute of frenzied violence which had followed our advance over the bank, or with what was to follow when we got into the wood. That day's battle, for me, was in two distinct parts, both of them vivid in my mind, but the connecting period is hazy. No doubt my mind was too full of what had happened to notice. I don't know how long a time elapsed in making that leftward movement, or how far we came from our original position on the bank, or what units of the company were on either side, or behind. Fighting was going on elsewhere. A young corporal was winning the MM clearing bunkers single-handed at about this time, and the interval may have been five minutes or thirty. Battle concentrates your attention on your own immediate front, and all I was aware of now was the fringe of trees in which we lay, and the shadowy interior beyond. The snipers who had cut down Parker and Steele and Little and the others must be in the wood ahead and to the right. Stanley, lying next to me, touched me on the shoulder. Beyond him, Gale was on his feet, motioning the section forward and stepping ahead into the wood. Someone muttered something about bunkers. Stanley and I looked at each other, what he saw, God knows, but what I saw was his sweating face with the lips drawn back from the teeth. He adjusted the Bren sling. I waited until he was ready, and we rose together and moved warily through the fringe of trees. There was undergrowth to our front, so I moved to the right with Stanley at my left elbow. It was dim after the glare of the open country, but through the trees immediately to our right front I could make out a clearing. What I couldn't see was any sign of a bunker, but they must be in there somewhere, so I took a nervous glance to see that Stanley was still there, and moved on slowly through the trees, safety catch-off, finger just touching the trigger. There was no one to my right, and the section was now out of eyeshot to my left. For a moment Stanley and I might have been alone in the wood, but I knew bloody well we weren't. The one comfort was that its other inhabitants hadn't seen us yet. I nerved myself to go on walking, as softly as could be, scanning the clump of bushes ahead, the tree trunks on either side, and the clearing beyond. There wasn't a sound, or a sign of a jap, and if firing was taking place farther off, I wasn't aware of it. A few more steps brought me to the bushes and I knelt down listening. The simple truth about war is that if you're on the attack, you can't do a damned thing until you find your enemy, and the only way to do that is to push on at whatever speed seems prudent until you see or hear him, or he makes his presence known by letting fly at you, as witness our first advance over the bank. Now it was the same thing over again, the difference being that the left flanking movement had brought us inside his position, and it was a question of who saw whom first and shot the straighter. Life closes in. I had no idea of what was happening elsewhere, 
no thought or use of the senses to spare for anything but what I saw as I knelt behind the bushes, across the clearing, maybe ten yards away, was the bunker. It was a big one, three man at least, a mound of hard red earth about four feet high, and probably the same depth underneath. There was a wide firing slit at ground level, but what lay behind the slit was darkness, no movement, and nothing in the trees beyond the bunker. I looked at Stanley, a yard behind me, his bren at the ready, and then I was going like a bat out of hell for a palm on the other side of the clearing. There was a crack from the firing slit, but it was threepence or three yen wasted, and as I fetched up at the tree its trunk between me and the bunker, Stanley ran forward, firing from the hip at the firing slit. Dust flew from the bunker as the bren burst hit it, and then the bloody gun jammed, Stanley yelled and tugged at the magazine. I thought I saw movement inside the firing slit, and as Stanley jumped aside, I found myself running forward, firing into the slit, three shots I think, and I believe there was a return shot and then I was diving down beside the bunker wall, about a yard to the side of the firing slit, fumbling for a grenade. I was facing back the way we'd come, and there were bush-hatted figures running through the trees, and the wood was suddenly alive with small arms fire, rifle and automatic. I yanked out the grenade pin, let the plunger go, forced myself to count 1,000, 2,000 and stretch sideways, back flat on the bunker, to whip the bomb through the firing slit. 1,000, 2,003. An ear-ringing crump, and I was snatching for a second grenade when Gale came running past, gesturing, and I followed him round the bunker side. There was the bunker entrance, a low, narrow doorway, and Gale had a green 77 phosphorus grenade in his hand. He threw aside the black safety cap as he reached the doorway and was in the act of tossing the grenade inside when he suddenly stood straight up. His bush hat fell off and the side of his face was covered with blood. He fell full length, landing almost at my feet and someone grabbed him and pulled him away. I was at one side of the doorway and a small sharp-faced sergeant whom I didn't know was at the other, with a tommy gun. Gale's phosphorus bomb hadn't exploded. They're dicey things with a tape which unwinds in flight and a ball and spring mechanism, but I had my second 36 grenade in one hand and my rifle in the other. The little sergeant also had a 36. He nodded. We pulled our pins together. He waited three seconds that seemed like hours, and we tossed them in, flattening against the bunker. On the heels of the double explosion he darted in, Thompson stuttering. Two quick bursts and he was out again. Three on him, he shouted, and his jaw dropped as he stared past me. I turned to see a Jap racing across in front of the bunker, a sword flourished above his head. He was going like Jesse Owens, screaming his head off right across my front. I just had sense enough to take a split second, traversing my aim with him before I fired. He gave a convulsive leap, and I felt that jolt of delight. I'd hit the bastard, and as he fell on all fours, the Highland officer with whom I'd played football dived on him from behind, slashing at his head with a kukri. Someone rounded the bunker, almost barging into me. It was Stanley, shouting, Where? Where? In that kind of mad scramble, all that matters is seeing the enemy. He had a Bren magazine in one hand, and was trying to change it for the one on the gun. I grabbed the barrel to steady it, burned myself, yelped, and seized the folded legs while he pushed the full magazine home. One of his putties was coming loose. A yard away, Gale was lying dead with two men bending over him. The whole wood was echoing with shots and explosions and yelling voices. Stanley ran past me, dropping the empty magazine, and as some Presbyterian devil made me pick it up, I noticed Gale's hat lying in the bunker doorway, and the little sergeant was shouting and running towards a second bunker. The sixty seconds I have just described, being among the most eventful of my life, I have been able to relate almost step by step. After that, it was more disconnected. There were half a dozen men at the second bunker, feeding in grenades and firing through the slit. A Jap was shot and bayoneted in the entrance, and then we were past it, making for the far verge of the wood. Shots came from an earthwork to our left. A man had his bush hat shot from his head. Usually when a hat is hit it stays in place, but this one spun off like a plate, landing several feet away, and a Jap appeared between the trees, and I shot him, and he fell against a trunk, and the little sergeant dropped his tommy gun and swore and picked it up again. The sequence of these things I can't be certain of because it all happened so quickly, or seemed to. I've spoken at the start of this paragraph of sixty seconds because I can't believe it took any longer and probably the rush from the first bunker to the second and on to the wood's edge took about the same. But if that little sergeant were to appear and tell me it took twenty minutes, I couldn't contradict him. We were in that wood four hours, according to the regimental history, killed 136 Japanese, 
and lost seven dead and forty-three wounded ourselves in the whole operation, but I wasn't conscious of time, only of the highlights of action. The fight at the first bunker is crystal clear, but the rest is a series of unrelated incidents. It was a hectic, murderous confusion. The whole section was in the wood, but Stanley is the only one I remember. Indeed, Gale is the only other I can positively identify from the entire platoon. The little sergeant was there most of the time. When we were lying on the edge of the wood covering the open ground beyond, I heard him asking for a field dressing, but which platoon he belonged to I never knew. When we opened fire at Japs moving on the open ground, the men on either side of me were strangers. One of them kept seeing Japanese in the trees beyond the open space, and blazed away, cursing, but I believe it was wishful thinking. Then we were withdrawing. Behind us the company were leaving the wood by the way we'd come in, and when we on the far side were ordered to fall back, we went quite slowly, with the little sergeant shouting hoarsely to take our time. He knew his business, that one, for as we retreated past the cleared bunkers to the front of the wood, he kept up an incessant patter of orders and encouragement. I have an idea he was a Welshman, keeping us in a rough line well spaced out, firing as we went, for Japs were filtering into the trees we had just left. He was next to me, firing short bursts. I had a shot at one running figure among the trees, and he went down, but I think it was a dive for cover. There was a film called Honky Tonk, in which Clark Gable had to back out of a saloon, covering the occupants with his gun and remarking, this reminds me of the days when we used to do all our walking backwards. The words came back to me in the temple wood, as such things will, and at some point the man on my left dropped to his knees, shouting, Look what I've got! I didn't identify the object, but what he did get a second later was a bullet in the leg from an unseen Jap, and he rolled over, shouting, They got me! The dirty rats, they got me! It wasn't a bad wound, a furrow just above the knee, and he hobbled out of the wood under his own steam, blaspheming painfully. That was the battle in the Temple Wood, an insignificant moment in the war. Its importance is personal. It was typical of the kind of action that was going on all around Maktila, and if figures mean anything we won it, although I am still puzzled about its conclusion. Japs were re-entering the wood as we left it, but they cannot have reoccupied it, for the battalion history's tally of Japanese killed is exact, not an estimate, and must have been made on the ground afterwards with ourselves in possession. So I conclude that the withdrawal in which I took part was not the end of the action, as I thought at the time. This is the trouble with eyewitness. It sees only part of the whole and is incomplete. If mine is patchy, I can only excuse it on the ground that I had never been in a fight to the death before, with the enemy at close quarters, which is, to say the least, confusing. I have tried to describe in plain terms what I saw and can be sure of. What I thought at the time is less clear, but some strong impressions remain. At the moment of fixing bayonets I had that hollow feeling which most writers locate in the stomach, but in my case manifests itself in the throat. After we were fired on, I didn't notice it. To say I was shocked at seeing Parker and Steele hit is correct in the sense that one is shocked by running into a brick wall. Astonishment and fascination came into it too. You read of such things. Now you see the reality and think, so that's what it looks like. The thought of being hit myself occurred only in the moment before I started crawling towards the Bren, to be submerged in relief when Stanley took possession. Going into the wood I was scared stiff, but not witless. Given Aladdin's lamp I would have been in Bermuda. No, that's not true. If it were I'd have kept out of the army in the first place. Being there with the choice made you go ahead, and if anyone says you could always change your mind and run away he's wrong you can't. It sounds pompous to say it's a matter of honour, but that's what it comes down to and Falstaff knew it. He was quite right, though, that honour hath no skill in surgery, which is why you are perfectly entitled to be scared. There is the consolation that once the shooting starts, the higher thought takes a back seat. Putting a grenade into a bunker had the satisfaction of doing grievous bodily harm to an enemy for whom I felt real hatred and still do. Seeing Gale killed shocked me as our first casualties had done, and I think enraged me. I wanted a Jap then, mostly for my own animal pride, no doubt, but seeing Gale go down sparked something which I felt in the instant when I hung on my aim at the Jap with the sword, because I wanted to be sure. The joy of hitting him was the strongest emotion I felt that day. I notice I've mentioned it twice. Perhaps I'm too self-analytical, but I'm trying to be honest. It's hard to say where fear and excitement meet, or which predominates. The best way I can sum up my emotions in that wood is to say that a continuous nervous excitement was shot through with occasional flashes of rage, terror, elation, relief, and amazement. 
so far as I have seen, most men are like that, by and large, although there are exceptions. A few really enjoy it. I've seen them, and I won't say they're deranged, because even the most balanced man has moments of satisfaction in battle, which are indistinguishable from enjoyment, short-lived though they may be. Some are blessed with the quick reflexes which, combined with experience, enable them to keep cool like the little sergeant. Others seem to be on a high, like the man who cried, Look what I've got! I was glad to come out of it. But even then I felt what I feel now, and what every old soldier feels, a gratitude for having been there, and an abiding admiration amounting to awe for the sheer ability of my comrades. Nowadays the highest praise a soldier can get is the word professional. 14th Army weren't professionals, they were experts. The aftermath was as interesting as the battle. Fiction and the cinema have led us to expect certain reactions from men in war, and the conventions of both demand displays of emotion, or a restraint which is itself highly emotional. I don't know what Nine Section felt, but whatever it was didn't show. They expressed no grief or anger or obvious relief, or indeed any emotion at all. They betrayed no symptoms of shock or disturbance, nor were they nervous or short, tempered. If they were quieter than usual that evening, well, they were dog-tired. Discussion of the day's events was limited to a brief reference to Gale's death and to the prospects of the wounded. Steel had been flown out on a flying taxi, one of the tiny fragile monoplanes to which stretchers were strapped. It was thought his. Wound was serious. Parker was said to be in dock in McTeela, and a few weeks later there were to be ironic congratulations when he returned to the section with a romantic star-shaped scar high on his chest. Penicillin was a new marvel then. Not a word was said about Tich Little, but a most remarkable thing happened, and I saw it repeated later in the campaign, which I have never heard of elsewhere, in fact or fiction, although I suspect it is as old as war. Teak's military effects and equipment, not of course his private possessions, or any of his clothing, were placed on a ground sheet, and it was understood that anyone in the section could take what he wished. Grandas took one of his mess tins, Forster, his housewife, making sure it contained only army issue and nothing personal. Nixon, after long deliberation, took his rifle, an old Lee Enfield shod in very pale wood, which surprised me, for it seemed it might make its bearer uncomfortably conspicuous. I took his piala, which was of superior enamel, unlike the usual chipped mugs. Each article was substituted on the ground sheet with our own possessions, my old piala, Forster's housewife, and so on, and it was bundled up for delivery to the quartermaster. I think everyone from the original section took something. It was done without formality, and at first I was rather shocked, supposing that it was a coldly practical, almost ghoulish proceeding. People exchanging an inferior article for a better one, nothing more, and indeed that was the pretext. Nick worked the bolt, squinted along the sights, hefted the rifle, and even looked in its butt trap before nodding approval. Grandass tossed his old mess tin onto the ground sheet with a mutter about the booger's andle being loose, but of course it had another purpose. Without a word said, everyone was taking a memento of teach. An outsider might have thought mistakenly that the section was unmoved by the deaths of Gale and Little. There was no outward show of sorrow, no reminiscences or eulogies, no Hollywood heart-searchings or phony philosophy. Forster asked, We's on force stag. Grandar said, Not me, any roads. Ours a boot knackered, and rolled up in his blanket. Nick cleaned tick his rifle. I washed and dried his piala, the new section commander. That young corporal who earlier in the day had earned the military medal told off the stag roster. We went to sleep. And that was that. It was not callousness or indifference or lack of feeling for two comrades who had been alive that morning and were now names for the war memorial. It was just that there was nothing to be said. It was part of war. Men died, more would die, that was past, and what mattered now was the business in hand. Those who lived would get on with it. Whatever sorrow was felt, there was no point in talking or brooding about it, much less in making, for form's sake, a parade of it. Better and healthier to forget it and look to tomorrow. The celebrated British stiff upper lip, the resolve to conceal emotion which is not only embarrassing and useless but harmful, is just plain common sense. But that was half a century ago. Things are different now when the media seem to feel they have a duty to dwell on emotion, the more harrowing the better, and to encourage its indulgence. The cameras close on stricken families at funerals, interviewers probe relentlessly to uncover grief, pain, fear and shock. No, no reticence or even decency in their eagerness to make the viewer's flesh creep. 
and wallow in the sentimental cliché. Victims are always innocent. Relatives must be loved ones. And the obscene intrusion is justified as caring and compassionate when it is the exact opposite. The pity is that the public shapes its behaviour to the media's demands. The bereaved feel obliged to weep and lament for the cameras and feel a flattering importance at their attention. Even young soldiers on the eve of action in the Gulf confessed, under a nauseating inquisition designed to uncover their fears, to being frightened. Of course they were frightened, just as we were. But no interviewer in our time was so shameless, cruel or unpatriotic as to badger us into admitting our human weakness for public consumption and thereby undermining public morale and our own. In such a climate, it is not to be wondered at that a general should agonise publicly about the fears and soul-searchings of command. Slim and Montgomery and MacArthur had them too, but they would rather have been shot than admit it. They knew the value of the stiff upper lip. The damage that fashionable attitudes reflected and created by television have done to the public spirit is incalculable. It has been weakened to the point where it is taken for granted that anyone who has suffered loss and hardship must be in need of counselling that soldiers will suffer from post-battle traumatic stress and need psychiatric help. One wonders how Londoners survived the Blitz without the interference of unqualified jargon-mumbling counsellors, or how an overwhelming number of 1940 servicemen returned successfully to civilian life without benefit of brainwashing. Certainly, a small minority needed help. War can leave terrible mental scars, but the numbers will increase and the scars enlarge, in proportion to society's insistence on raising spectres which would be better left alone. Tell people they should feel something and they'll not only feel it, they'll regard themselves as entitled and obliged to feel it. It is a long way from the Templewood to Sheffield, and not only in miles. I knew a young Liverpudlian who, following the Hillsborough disaster, stayed away from work because, he said, of the grief he felt for those supporters of his team who had died on the terraces. He didn't know them, he hadn't been there but he was too distressed to work. Suppose Grandas or the Battle of Britain pilots with infinitely greater cause had been too distressed to fight. One shouldn't be too hard on the young man. He had been conditioned to believe that it was right, even proper, to indulge his emotions. He probably felt virtuous for having done so. Fortunately for the world, my generation didn't suffer from spiritual hypochondria, but then we couldn't afford it. By modern standards, I'm sure we, like the whole population who endured the war, were ripe for counselling, but we were lucky. There were no counsellors. I can regret, though, that there were no modern television journalists transported back in time to ask Grandas, How did you feel when you saw Corporal Littleshot dead? I would have liked to hear the reply.